we are not the only kinds of intelligence. So it's important to consider the diverse forms the mind can take on Earth and in the universe beyond. I think we need to understand how brains evolve to work. So what we're looking at is a completely different neural architecture. I first gained interest in the mind of the octopus when I was in a lab full of marine invertebrates. There was one of those animals that seemed to be studying me as much as I was studying it. I am Dominic Sibatilli. I am a graduate student in behavioral neuroscience and astrobiology at the University of Washington. The octopus fits into our research program because they stand out as an extreme example of intelligence that has evolved along a completely different trajectory than that of the vertebrates. Yet, the octopus is solving many of the same problems that you or I would solve. My name is David Geyer. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Washington, and my lab studies comparative systems neuroscience. That means we study how different kinds of brains process information. In a broad sense, octopus nerves do function like ours. They have physiological properties that are very similar, and yet they're forming networks that are completely different from the networks we see in our brains. So it takes more time for information in the octopus's nervous system to get from point A to point B compared to vertebrates, whose neurons can fire a lot faster. Because it takes so long, how these systems are designed plays a much bigger role in how they can compute. The octopus brain is distributed with two-thirds of its neurons in its arms. There's actually this dense network of neural clusters, or ganglia, that are locally controlling the muscles. So you can have a bunch of little individual decisions being made along the arm, which don't necessarily agree with each other. This creates a unique form of movement that the octopus is able to possess. If we're watching a rodent look for some food pellets, we're seeing some nice rhythmic motion, but when we watch an octopus, it's almost like watching the fluid environment itself moving across the surface of the rocks. There's an extreme density of chemoreceptors in the suckers of the octopus. They literally can smell and taste with their arms. So it seems like the way the octopus deals with having eight independent arms and having to process all of that sensory information is that it has located a lot of sensory processing as close as possible to the external world. In a way, the octopus has sent its mind out into the environment to meet it halfway. Key to understanding their intelligence is to understand how this distributed network is sharing information with itself. Legos are a form of enrichment in the lab, uh, much the same way they are for my four-year-old kid. <laughs> we try to give them a variety of these kinds of textures so that this extensive peripheral nervous system they have is always kept occupied and active. No matter how hard one can work in that lab, we'll all still spend a few minutes playing with them. This is really important to them because they're very exploratory, they're very curious animals, and at the same time as enriching them, we can also study how their arm is processing information and how their suckers are processing information. In designing puzzles that these animals will solve, we're looking to challenge different parts of the nervous system and to see how information is going to be integrated across the arms. Where we began with two-dimensional tracking, now our methods are more sophisticated. We now use three-dimensional tracking cameras, which are stereo cameras. And this is helping us understand the strategies that the octopus is using to control its distributed mind. And we can interface that with virtual reality. This will help us pick up patterns that we may not have seen before. It gives us an entirely different perspective on our data and the movement of our animals.
So we can infer what might be going on in their brains by using puzzles and motion tracking. But to really test that, we need to move towards electrophysiology and make recordings from the nervous system while the animals are making decisions. You can imagine trying to fit electronic hardware onto an animal like that is probably nearly impossible. Yet, we're at a really exciting point now in the lab. We're using techniques that have been pioneered by Josh Smith's lab in computer science and engineering to use a wireless, battery-free system to implant tiny electronics into large octopuses. So once we do a small incision and implant the device, the animal will never have to think about it again. And we as researchers can stream the data and power the device without ever disturbing the animal. In some ways, this is a watershed moment in general for science. If we understand how a neural structure like the octopus nervous system can solve difficult problems, we might be able to design better ways to solve similar problems artificially. We reach out to them across the evolutionary divide out of curiosity to understand this unknown as they are. So it's like we're meeting each other halfway through our mutual interest in novelty in the unknown.